In talking about software for uh, large-scale engineering problems on the largest machines that we've got today. And I'm really going to talk about a software abstraction that we're using that's based on this idea of, well, you heard about directed acyclic graphs this morning. So this is the idea that you can actually put software together based on directed acyclic graphs. And the, the intention there is to try and somehow put together software frameworks that will work across and many different machines at many different scales. And what I'm going to try and do is show you what people have been doing in that space, talk about what we've been doing in that space, and talk about probably what needs to be done in the future. Um, I'm very happy to take questions as we go, if, that's, if you'd like to do that. In fact, I prefer to take questions as we go. So please jump in if there's something that I'm assuming that you know or there's something that's not clear. And uh, we'll just, I've got plenty of material so we can cut it short or, or keep going as, as uh, you know, depending on what happens. Okay, so um, the starting point for this is the idea of structuring software in a different way. So if you like, if you come from a computer science background, the concept is really data flow in the sense of you think about putting software together as a set of components and you specify only the relationships between those components, what one component needs from another, not when those components will actually execute. So you might think of a program that was looking something like this little diagram here, which you'll see repeated a number of times. At the same time, you'll also see that there are people who are saying, well, this is the, a really good way to go forward for the exascale machines and so on. And so I want to draw your attention to this diagram here, which is kind of the, the hype curve. And if you look at the way people look at technology, uh, you'll see that sometimes they get kind of excited about it and there's this peak of inflated expectations and then they get disappointed when they can't do what they want with it. There's a trough of disillusionment and then gradually this slope of enlightenment and this plateau of productivity. So the question is, are we here with this approach or are we here? You know, did people already, have, you know, people might have tried this in the past. This is a very interesting way of looking at kind of where we are and trying to think about uh, the nature of technology and how it's used and how we react to it. So if you think about uncertainty quantification, for example, I would argue that in, in terms of uncertainty quantification, we're probably round about here. Everybody got very excited about it three or four years ago, and then they realized it was really very hard to get much done, and now they're kind of picking up and, you know, we'll, we'll get back to this point in, in a while. So I need to thank a bunch of people as well. Uh, we've had uh, funding from DOE over a long period of time, from 97 to 2010, uh, for our ASCII project. NSF funding, which is actually the trigger for much of the work that's gone on here. DOE NETL funding that carried on from this, and now NNSA funding for, as part of a PSAP2 center. Funding from the Army Research Lab in a related effort on multi-scale modeling. Uh, we've very, very, been very, very happy with the uh, awards of computer time that we've got from the Insight program and the Exceed program, and we're busy at the moment working our way through 200 million hours on Mira that's been in incredibly helpful in terms of trying to solve one of the problems I'm going to talk about. Okay, so the, the first part of the talk is really background motivation, um, some discussion of how people are using directed acyclic graphs, and something about software. But first, I really want to um, mention the projects that are driving this. So we have an, a small NSF project that's about a million dollars, but we've, we've had almost five and a half years of funding on that that, that's actually provided the, the core of the work that I'm going to mention. And that work was really done by these two students, Ching Yu Meng and Justin Luchens. Justin's now at NVIDIA. Ching Yu Meng is at, at Google. And um, sort of following on from that, we have this PSAP problem, which is the, the, the coal boiler um, that we're trying to model. So this is a very large project uh, over uh, five years and uh, led by um, my colleague in the Institute for Clean and Secure Energy. And I'm lucky enough to be the computer science lead on that. And finally, we have an electronic materials by design project that's coming out of the Army Research Lab. I'm not going to say much about this, but it is similar to some of the efforts that are taking place at Argonne and other places to improve the design of things like batteries and fuel cells and so on. And in fact, the challenge is here are larger than 
in these other two cases, and we're only really just starting to get to grips with those. Okay, so um, I thought as you had um, sort of, you know, I guess it's nearly two weeks of lectures, and I'd ask you some questions. So I thought the first question I'd ask you is, can you explain this statement? Bill Harrod made this statement in a supercomputing 2012 talk. He said, today's bulk synchronous model is approaching uh, an efficiency, scalability, and power wall. And by bulk synchronous, we mean you do a bunch of um, computation. We do communications, and then computation again in this way. What do you, why did he say that, do you think? Why, is, why are we approaching this challenge with this mode of, of writing uh, uh, programs? You know, so in MPI, for instance, we have a whole bunch of you know, MPI tasks, and then we have to do some kind of collective or do a time step or something. Yeah. Well, synchronization kills your efficiency because you're spending most of your time waiting. Right. So the challenge is, but, you know, but we've had to deal with that all along, you know, and we can, we've got MPI programs that run on hundreds of thousands of cores. Why is it going to get worse? Well, it gets worse if you have more nodes. Right, okay, so the, the, that's the key thing. As we go to larger and larger machines, um, everything becomes, in some sense, less certain. If, you're, if your data is coming from some distance, you may have to wait much longer, and you can't afford to synchronize, essentially. So you want to synchronize as, as infrequently as is possible, and you want to try and make sure that you keep your cores busy. So I guess there was a, um, a statement in the Exascale reports that came out of DARPA in, uh, um, in about 2009. Um, Vivek Sarkar led one of those reports. He said, it, basically, you have to prioritize critical path tasks and non-critical path tasks. Use this acyclic graph approach and, and schedule and rebalance and do all these things. And that's one way of looking at it. And his thesis, as you'll see in the next slide or so, is, is in this area. So he would say that. The other take on this comes from somebody who won a, pro a parallel processing award over the last five years who said, this has always been a bad idea. You know, it's a bad idea when it was first introduced. It's never taken off, and it's a bad idea now. I think we managed to convince him that wasn't necessarily the case, but he's clearly not happy about the situation. Uh, and in fact, you know, where we are now is we have more uncertainty than at any time in the past in terms of computer architecture. We really just don't know what's coming. Uh, you know, there are many plans and, and you know, there, there are product lines which are changing, morphing. Uh, you know, the, if you look at what's happening with GPUs, for instance, every two years we get a new GPU with new features, which is, you know, you have to essentially rewrite your code to some extent. We know that the if you look at Intel's roadmap for feature size, we know that 14 nanometers is on its way in the next year or so. We know that people are talking about 10 nanometers in terms of the feature size so as, as, as defining a chip. We also know that if you read about this, that those numbers don't mean as much as they used to in terms of really being def, uh, a precise description of what's going on on the chip. So there's all sorts of uncertainty that we're trying to deal with. And so how do we design software? How do we think about software to deal with that? So some historical background. There's a very nice thesis, which you can still buy. Um, Vivek Sarkar wrote a thesis on, on this approach. He talked about graphical representations. He talked about uh, actually having data flows for execution. So he, and, and he sort of laid out some of the main ideas, and he's been working on this ever since. And the codes came along, the charm code, sort of charm plus plus code from uh, Sanjay Kali and, and colleagues at I Illinois, um, really uh, uh, to, Champagne urbana uh, basically was the first major code, I think, that really did this. Steve Parker pioneered this with the Uinta code a little bit afterwards as well. And uh, essentially, if you look at the literature, for instance, there's a lot of work by Oliver Sinan on um, task scheduling for, for you know, graph-based approaches. If you look in, a, in his book, it really tells you that all this stuff is just about impossible in terms of complexity and so on. So there are... Um, Nevertheless, we are engineering codes that really um, make these approaches work, and what I'm going to do is show you kind of how we do that, despite the graphs, that are, you know, the fact that they're graph-based. So some of the approaches that are around, I've mentioned the Uinta code that originated with Steve Parker. Um, Steve went to SGI in about 2004, 5, I guess, and we kind of took over from where he left off. Jack Dongara's Plasma software uses this graph-based approach to solve linear algebra problems. I mentioned Charm++ already. Star PU is an effort out of sort of France and Spain, I think coming originally from the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And the idea here is that you have applications, you have your compilers and libraries, you generate the task graphs, 
The task graphs are then mapped onto either CPUs or GPUs in whichever language that, that, that's, uh, that's generated for those particular machines. So um, a number of efforts underway. There are many more approaches as well. These are just a few examples. Well, why does this work well? Well, um, the idea really is that you try and eliminate synchronization points that you don't need. Um, you try and have excess parallelism by having multiple task graphs, at least in our case. You try and overlap communication and computation by executing whatever you can when you can. And you also try and load balance uh, complex applications by having a sufficiently a uh, large number of tasks and a sufficiently rich mi uh, mix of tasks. And uh, Tom Sterling was talking about this at the conference I was at in Boston this week, and he had this diagram which showed uh, an MPI code, and you could see the synchronization, these bars, the, the white bars, essentially, and he had an HPX code. Unfortunately, as far as I can see, his on his diagram, these codes take the same amount of time, so he doesn't appear to have gotten the advantage from this, but uh, I, in practice, you would get an advantage, I guess. So that's the idea. You cut the synchronization out. You cut out waiting. OK, and so here are some examples from Charm++. I, have a, um, I can show you similar examples from the Uinta code. The NAMD code is one of the most popular codes on the NSF machines, the, the molecular dynamics code. But this approach is also was a, applied to problems like rocket simulations in the uh, DOE um, ASCII center that they had there a, a number of years ago. Um, crack propagation, growth of dendrites, and, and so on, space-time remeshing, and, and, and many other examples. So this approach has uh, been applied to many different situations, and it has been successful to some extent. But it's not one of these things that is automatically successful. What I'm going to try and show you in the rest of this talk, really what you need to do to make it successful. OK. So we. There were lots of discussions this morning about software and software engineering and, and the kind of things that you need to do. And one of the comments was that uh, you'd really like to write at a higher level as possible. And then in the last talk, uh, we heard that that's always kind of challenging when it comes to uh, running on uh, large machines. Um, so one way of dealing with this is to use a kind of layered software approach. So the kind of thing that we do is we have a number of software components um, that are essentially written in an abstract form. They're written in this sort of task graph form. So ICE is a fluid code. Uh, the material point method code, NPM, that we have is represents solids in terms of particles. So you can think of this. Uh, as a kind of particle and cell code for solids. Arches is the combustion code that we're using on this large boiler that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Nebo and Wasatch are actually components of a domain-specific language approach that's developed for this boiler that we're looking at. And what we do with all of those is we generate tasks that are coupled together in this form. These tasks are then compiled either for GPUs, for CPUs, or for the Xeon Phi. And we then execute these tasks through a runtime system, which has components like uh, it has an overall simulation controller, it has a scheduler, it has a load balancer, and I'll show you some of the other components that are in there shortly. But it's this runtime system that essentially makes it possible for us to get scalability of the application by executing these tasks in an intelligent fashion. The way that the tasks themselves are written determines how much uh, floating point performance you get out of them. But the scalability depends on the runtime system. And it's this idea of a runtime system that's really central to what I'm talking about, because it's the runtime system that makes it possible for us to go from uh, 600 to 600,000 cores um, without changing any of this. Of course, that's not strictly true. We found a number of bugs in those uh, applications, packages over the years. But strictly speaking, if they'd been written correctly in, in the first place, nothing would have changed. The, the logical structure of them has not changed. OK, so that's the idea. What does the code itself uh, look like? Well, I mentioned ICE and NPM and Arches. Um, the central abstraction that's used is the idea of a mesh block, a hexahedral mesh block. And 
um, that patch, that mesh block, is what's sort of uh, a central part of the framework that we have. It's not clear that that's the only way to represent meshes inside this kind of framework. It certainly isn't. And we could probably do the same thing for unstructured meshes and are being, well, we're getting some gentle pressure to move in that direction, in fact. Um, but what we do is we, we, we use this notion of a patch and the halo elements that are off the sides of that patch where patches communicate as part of the runtime system that we have. Um, I mentioned these components. There's also a molecular dynamics component which we're using in our work with the Army on multi-scale modeling. Um, when we're working with these mesh patches, we also use mesh refinement, and we're using essentially a structured grid approach um, with unstructured points corresponding to the particles. So the particles move across the domain. They're not fixed in one place. And so that makes load balancing challenging. As we adaptively refine the mesh, uh, we also have to rebalance the mesh. Um, uh, what we do typically is use a simple approach based on regular refinement. So any cell that has one of the, these blue refinement indicators in is refined. We don't use a more sophisticated approach like the burger gutzos mesh, meshing approach because it's very hard to get that to scale. In fact, we failed to get that to scale beyond about 12,000 cores. At the same time, we have to dynamically uh, load balance the calculations that we have because we have fluid structures and adaptive meshes. And here we've used a sort of profiling and forecasting model based on actually observing what the cores are doing and using a mixture of our predicted uh, load balance for the next time step and the actual, uh, the previous value for the execution time. Uh, one of the other things that we do is that we only load balance at the nodal level. We don't load balance each of the individual cores, say, on a multi-core machine. OK, so here's an example of some code. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially, this is the sort of way that things are specified. We have um, a mesh specification at the top here. So for instance, we have sort of, um, 25 patches, 25 cube patches here. We've got 50 by 50 by 50 in terms of the mesh. We've got eight mesh patches. We've got one level of halo cells connecting those patches. So the stencil in one mesh patch needs one level of information from the patches on either side. And here we have the sort of the, the code that schedules the, the, the main sort of uh, time integration uh, piece of the Burgers equation example I'm talking about. So we basically specify in this what each task requires. So in, in the sense of the ghost layers around the nodes, uh, it requires a, a, a time step, for example, as well as a solution component. And it computes a new solution. And then it, uh, it, it basically, with this um, sequence of commands, we have enough information and, and a bunch of other stuff, too, to specify the connectivity of the different tasks. And so here's the code itself. Um, again, I'm not going to go in, into it in detail, but we're solving this very simple 1D uh, PDE. We, the, the, the sort of the blue comments essentially tell you what's going on in the sense that we're looping over all patches on this processor. We're getting data from the data warehouse, uh, including one layer of ghost cells. Uh, we get the space and time increments, delta T and delta X. We allocate memory for the new results. We have a sort of iterator loop that goes round and essentially creates the new solution values, this new U. And then new U goes back into the new data warehouse. So what we're doing is we start with an old data warehouse. We take information from it as specified by the requires. We do a bunch of computation on that and produce the computes which go back into the new data warehouse for the next time step. And that's the sort of basic uh, compute paradigm that we employ. Um, so here's a summary of, of the task-based approach. Each task defines its uh, computation with required inputs and outputs. Uh, we create a task graph. Here's an example task graph from the, the fluids code, from the ice code. And then tasks do not explicitly themselves have MPI commands in. They only specify what they need from an abstract data warehouse that sits on each node and what they're going to put back in. So the user does not actually write any MPI or any communications explicitly in any shape or form. Um, as I've said before, we kind of overlap communication and computation. 
and we do adaptive computation. Now, one thing that you might say is, well, this task graph doesn't look very complicated. How on earth do you get these, pro uh, these problems to scale at the, you know, at, at the edge of the machines that we have today, you know, 700,000 cores or more? Well, um, what's, what there is, in fact, I'll just go back to the previous slide, is um, on each node, we have a number of patches. Each patch has its own task graph. And we have what I call the task soup, essentially, that we execute on each multi-core node. So what that means is that we can do things like um, execute tasks from the same patch on two different cores. So we can, we can steal work from, from one patch and execute that onto a, on, onto a core that's waiting for something to do. And in contrast to many situations, the kind of the more you put into this, the easier it gets to a certain extent. So if you start to think about multi-scale calculations and multi-physics calculations, this, these, these get more complicated, but that just means there's a richer mix of tasks to pick um, the work that you're going to do from. The runtime system itself, here's a sort of simplified schematic of it. Uh, what we've got are things like some dependency analysis of the, of the graph. We have a scheduler that schedules the tasks. We monitor whether there's load imbalance. If there's load imbalance, we, 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 we rebalance the tasks. We uh, look for when the grid changes, change the grid, reload balance, and, and, and go on in this sort of fashion. So this is the, the, where the sort of smart piece of this is. And the simulation component itself sits outside of this, as would any linear solver, for example. So we use the hyper solver, and we've used Petsy in the past. But they sit outside of this, and the runtime system is the piece that we've worked on. And most of what I'm talking about is really the work of these two graduate students. So we, we started on this code in about 2005, and, and six, when it really wasn't very effective on large systems and wasn't very good at doing things like mesh refinement. And these two graduate students, Justin Luchens and Ching Yu Meng, basically took this code from literally 600 to 1,000 cores to 600,000 cores or more. So it's interesting to see what uh, two very smart people can do. So I also want to emphasize, though, because you know, with this hype curve that I had at the beginning of the talk in mind, this isn't a silver bullet. You can't magically you know, uh, get a graph-based approach for your software, and it's going to suddenly scale, and everything's going to be just fine. If you look at what we've done, there were three phases, at least, of, of work. In the first phase, we did overlap communication with computation. But the graph was executed in a static fashion. The data structures weren't that efficient. There was one MPI process per core, no mesh refinement. In the second phase, we got mesh refinement to work to about 12,000 and then 100,000 cores. Changed a lot of the data structures, started to do things like out of order execution and dynamic task execution, and really started to change the code quite considerably. So at the level of the runtime system, the applications codes didn't change. And then in the third phase, we went to a sort of approach where we're using one MPI process per core. Uh, we have a, you, we're using P threads on each, on each node. S sorry, one MPI process per node, P threads on each core, essentially one data warehouse per node to save on, on storage. And to do things like uh, have multiple cores and GPUs, essentially grab tasks when they're needed. And uh, we also were, were able to get good use of hyper for solving large systems and linear equations. So these are some of the older results where things really didn't scale past about 1,000 cores you know, initially. And those are the sorts of results that we generated in the past by just the very simplest approach with the task graph. So the task graphs are really good, but you've got to do a lot of work to really make sure that you execute them efficiently and make the best use of them. So what we've got is a blob of material moving uh, through a fluid. The blob is represented by particles, and there's an adaptive mesh that follows it. Let's just do that again. Um, so uh, we, what we have is fluid structure interaction with an adaptive mesh. It's a relatively straightforward benchmark example, but it's actually very challenging. I mean, we, we weren't sure we could get this to scale because of the combination of particles only in some parts of the domain, adaptive meshes and the combination of the, the solids code and the fluids code. So um, our kind of basic approach, really, to, 
to getting this to work was essentially to have the following kind of architecture on each node. I mentioned before that we've got one data warehouse uh, per node, which holds all the information that's, that's, that, that's sort of needed. The cores run the different tasks and check the queues to see which um, objects are, which tasks are ready to be executed. Uh, information to the, is passed via MPI through the network to other uh, nodes, but the task codes themselves don't necessarily the, uh, see that. It, it's all sort of hidden through the data warehouse. And information about what's ready to be executed is passed from the data warehouse to the task queues. So that's the kind of approach that's adopted to um, try and get the, these codes to scale. The, one of the key things, as we'll see, is that we actually had to have a, a very um, cleverly designed data warehouse so that all these cores could actually access variables without contention. And that's a key issue in doing something like this. Um, that diagram doesn't really give you uh, a terribly clear idea of what the, the code on each core actually looks like. So here's an example. You know, we, on each, each of these threads that executes on a core, we have this execution layer. It posts tasks and you know, the MPI receives. It checks the records and finds tasks that are ready. It selects the task and executes it. It posts the task and the MPI sends. Uh, so it interacts with the, the data structures that represent the task queue and interacts with the data warehouse to get the variables that it needs for the calculation. So a very different sort of architecture from how most codes are structured. Um, I mentioned that we've gone to one MPI process per node. And um, this diagram sort of shows you why that's a good thing to do. So here we have a bunch of patches in blue with the halo elements in green. And the two approaches are to use one MPI process per uh, patch and one MPI process per node with threads for the individual patches. So if you look at the data on this simple example, um, we're using something, if you take into account the MPI buffers, we're using something like 75k doubles here and only 40k here. As we increase the size of the computation, the uh, situation gets worse for the MPI, one MPI process per core. And on some experiments we did on the old NSF Kraken machine, we only used something like 11% of the memory in this case uh, compared to this case. So um, how many of you have got MPI codes where you're using one MPI per core? And how many of you have thought about using something like OpenMP or Threads or something? OK. Um, we had a debate about, now, how would you choose between OpenMP and Threads? What are the trade-offs? OpenMP is easier. OpenMP is easier, OK. But if you look at the new standard, it's going to come out, it's going to be also more flexible. It's going to be more flexible, OK. So anybody care to argue in the other direction? You try not to choose. You try not to choose. Ah, but you have to choose sometime, don't you? <laughs> OK, so, so, so we agonized over this for a long time. And I, I teach parallel computing. And uh, one of the things I noticed when using OpenMP was that it really it was very hard to get a good relationship between what you write and the performance that you get. One of, for those of you from DOE, one of your colleagues put it rather more succinctly at a workshop that we had in Utah a couple of weeks ago. He said, trying to get performance with OpenMP is like doing surgery in mittens. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, we can have this discussion. But the, 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 the challenge, I think, is that it, it, it's exactly what I said earlier. It, it's, it's not very clear, um, but it's not very easy to see the relationship between what you write and what you get. And that's because there's levels of abstraction and indirection in there. And so it's quite hard to get performance out of it in that sense because of this. So anyway, we decided to go this way. And it was very interesting at the workshop. We had three teams, three NNSA teams from um, Livermore, from Sandia, and from Los Alamos. And I said, well, was this the right decision? And they were like, yeah, we think so. Um, sure. Are you also transferring the, uh, across? Uh, corners or no? Not for this. 
No. We could do, we could specify. We, we, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how we want to, how we can specify things if we have to. So we, 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 it, you, can, you can specify a whole bunch of different levels. You can specify different halo levels and all kinds of things. So, it, so it's sort of, uh, it's possible to do many different things. Okay, so a lot of um, intelligence in terms of how we execute tasks and so on. So here's an example. You know, we have a task pool with MPI on each node. And then if we, if we execute the tasks at random, or if we execute them in a first come, first served approach or a sort of patch order, what we see is that we get the best performance by executing the tasks that have the most external messages first. And so you see the time drops here from random execution from 300 seconds to uh, about 139 if we execute the tasks that have the most external messages first. Um, as, as a sort of scheduling algorithm, and that seems to make a huge difference for us. Um, there's another issue to do with granularity. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, well, what's the overhead of this? Well, the overhead isn't huge, um, but what you see is that you have to balance the size of the task um, against the overhead that you might see, because if you have many, many small tasks, there's a lot of overhead in, in how you monitor those tasks, and there's not a lot of work in one. Um, if you have very few large tasks, that means that you're likely to have gaps because you can't fill any gaps in with, by putting ex extra tasks in. So what you typically see is if you look at the, um, the performance, what we've got here are the, the sort of the wait times and queue times. So we've got the, the queue length. As the queue length drops, the kind of the wait time increases, the time that's spent waiting. So, um, and then when you see here is if you look at patch sizes, we're going, you probably can't see this, is eight, eight cubed to 24 cubed. And what we're looking at is the overall execution time, which is the solid line. Um, so this solid line is the execution time. And uh, what you see is there is a sweet spot somewhere between 12 cubed and 15 cubed. Um, there was a, a discussion about debugging and so on. And uh, we've had a lot of fun working on, on these machines as they come on board and trying to understand how to get performance. Here we're looking at the performance of different components. This is the overall execution time. One of these is global communications. The other one is MPI wait times and so on, regridding. And you see that many of them are sort of down in the noise on this log log plot. But you see here also that the MPI wait time has suddenly kicked up as we go from 120 five to 256k cores, and you're seeing scaling break down. And the, the performance that you see is shown here, we go, where we get this very poor scaling, or we did, I, I, this is in, case, in this case, just out to 98k cores. And what we've got is strong scaling here, so a fixed problem size, so this should be a straight line as we you know, double the number of cores, the time should drop by half. And weak scaling should be horizontal. So you see this thing is really not working. And the kind of thing that we see is that we get a breakdown of scaling sometimes. We got it on Jaguar with faster cores and a faster network because the data warehouse wasn't efficient enough. And uh, we struggled with that and, and had to really rewrite the data warehouse at some point. And the way that we did it was by moving to um, an approach that allows the variables in the data warehouse to be, ex uh, to be accessed by successive cores much more quickly and efficiently without having uh, very heavyweight locks on them. So we used um, lock-free data structures essentially based on uh, atomic operations which are available on most of the modern uh, CPUs these days. So we use this sort of um, fetch and ab, fetch and subtract, uh, compare and swap ones to both read and write simultaneously and also essentially redesign the data structure so that we could do updates with compare and swap and, and do re re reduction operations uh, more quickly as well. And what we saw was that on 32 cores, for example, we got a speed up of uh, over two by using this approach compared to using the original lock-based approach. And this was in the one example of the kind of thing that we need to do to get our calculations to scale. So if we talk about uh, how a code like this actually executes, I have to be honest and say that until about 18 months, two years ago, we didn't really know what was going on. I mean, this thing was working, it was scaling, but we had no idea of how much out of order execution it was doing and so on. So for a paper a couple of years ago, we, or um, I guess just over a year ago, we wrote uh, some analysis tools that enabled us to understand what was happening. 
So we've got three machines here. We've got the Titan machine, we've got the Stampede machine with its uh, Xeon Phi cores, and we've got Mira. Uh, on Titan, we're just running on the CPUs, and on Mira, we're just running, uh, sorry, on Stampede, we're just running on the CPUs too. And what you're seeing is that the straight blue line is what would happen if all the ta tasks executed in order. The green crosses are where the tasks actually executed. So for example, this cross here is tasks 400 and something executing in slot 1,000 and something. So it's executing very late. And the tasks here are executing early. Uh, the tasks below the line are executing early. Uh, and, and what you're seeing is that the um, execution order uh, first of all, appears to have more out of order, uh, late execution than early, which is a bit odd. But then if you think about it, if you, the way that we measured it, if you're executing tasks one, two, three, four, and five, and you execute task four early, tasks two and three are executed late. So that explains the asymmetry in the, in, in, in the execution structure. If you look carefully, is that there are subtle differences in how the tasks because they're you know they're different CPUs they're different communications structures and so on and that leads to a different execution pattern on each of these machines uh, to maintain scalability at the same time it's, it's natural to ask well what is this um, you know what is each core actually doing so here's a breakdown from one of the weak scaling runs of what's going on this in this case, we have only two mesh patches per core. So quite a lot of the work is done in, in basically packing and unpacking and interacting with the, um, sorry, packing and unpacking data and interacting with the data warehouse and dealing with the MPI side of things. And then you see the sort of the blue is the actual execution time um, for the, in the three cases, Mira, Titan, and Stampede. And you see the, 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 how much time is spent in each case doing each particular part of the calculation. So um, that gives you some idea of, of what we, you know, what's actually going on in terms of the individual execution and the scalability. Well, I've been in Utah since about 2003, and it's a fairly exciting place to be. Um, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So somebody had the bright idea of putting an explosives factory at the bottom of the most dangerous road in Utah. And this explosives factory was producing seismic boosters. And these boosters are between two and a half and five and a half pounds of explosive. And he had about 8,000 of them in a semi. He decided to go around a corner too fast. The, the, the truck rolled over, caught fire. Uh, they pulled him out of the truck. He said, what's in the truck? He said, explosives. Uh, they cleared the area three minutes later. Here's our evidence for a detonation. All this stuff went off at once. And, you know, uh, but the reason, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning all this is we don't really know why it detonated or why it should all detonate at once, because these things were small boosters stored in boxes and so on. And there are different regimes. If you have a deflagration, you have a, a, a kind of a wave moving at about 400 meters per second, and not all the explosive is consumed. Well, looking at this, it all seems to have kind of gone. Um, in a detonation, the wave moves at 8,500 meters per second, roughly, and all the explosive is consumed. So what we're trying to do is to model this. This is our NSF project. And what we can do is we can show now for, for 2D cases and axisymmetric 3D cases that we can get detonation. We get uh, pressures of over 5 gigapascals, shown in red here as the simulation moves forward. And what we're trying to do now is just to finish off the full 3D runs to show that you would get detonation with the model that we've put together over the last uh, four and a half years or so. So this is our driving example. And it's been a challenge to get this to scale. We only really just got this to work on Mira over the last couple of months. And uh, here are the scalability results from the first few time steps because we try and make sure that most of the time is spent on the science and not on the testing. And so we're looking at strong scaling runs here, four strong scaling runs. The final one goes out to 512K cores and shows good strong scalability. But only after we've done quite a bit of work on the regridder, on things like how we copied data on the task graph compilation and on how the AMR, the adaptive mesh refinement, was supported. Um, 500,000 patches, 1.3 billion mesh cells, 
um, 7.8 billion particles, fluid structure interaction with adaptive meshing, scaling to half a million cores on the mirror machine. So we're very pleased with that result. And we're, at, at, at the moment, we're just busy chewing our way through the science. If we look at the, uh, the test calculation that I talked about, the block of material moving through the fluid, um, and do some scaling experiments on that, um, we can see that here we have two resolutions. This, the, the green line is mirror uh, out to 768K cores. The, the, the purple line is, is blue waters out to about 700 plus K cores. And what we're looking at is the, the average time per time step. We see strong scale, good strong scalability, perhaps not quite as good with mirror as with blue waters, but we'll see an example in which that's reversed shortly. And we're getting good scaling out to about 700,000 cores for this example of mesh refinement and fluid structure interaction. Uh, this run was kind of interesting because we didn't have an allocation on blue waters and they gave us 10 million hours and that was about all the time we had. So we were able to get the calculation to run on mirror and Ching Yu Meng had one run to get all this stuff to work and it all worked beautifully. I mean, it was very impressive. Um, and I, I'm not sure Google know how lucky they are. Um, okay, so summary of the scalability improvements. One MPI process per multi-core node reduces memory to about 10%. You have to worry about the mesh sizes that you use. Use one data warehouse to save storage. Prioritize tasks with the most external communications and lots of other things as well. Use out of order execution when possible. And these are the things that enable us to get the scaling results that I've shown. Here is our kind of exascale problem that pushes the rest of the work I'm going to talk about briefly. So this is a, a clean coal boiler. Essentially what they're doing is injecting oxygen and pulverized coal at the corners of this thing. You see the, uh, the movie on the left shows the turbulent combustion that's taking place. Um, the scale of this thing is considerable. Here's a little stick man representing one of my co-investigators, Jeremy Thornock. This thing's about 60 meters tall, or will be when they build it, and um, uh, 350 megawatts. So it, it's a fairly considerable thing that then they want to design it correctly, where they want to design it in the most efficient fashion, and it's going to be come on stream in some time like about um, 2018. Uh, by curious coincidence, they're going to put it about uh, 30 miles from where I grew up in England. But um, so. Um, this is what we're working on as part of our PSAP project. Oh, yes, the other thing is, I guess, um, essentially, to get the resolution that's required for this, we need millimeter scale resolution for this object that's 60 meters tall. And uh, that means that we have a problem to solve that's about 1,000 times larger than the largest problems that we solve today. Um, in order to, this diagram shows you what, why we need that millimeter resolution. What we've got here is the uh, energy associated with different wave numbers uh, at, at different points in the calculation. So this is the flame. This is what's going on near a nozzle. And in order to essentially resolve the, the different waves, the high energy waves, we really need to go down to about a millimeter. Uh, what we're doing is using a large eddy simulation approach there's all kinds of things in here. There's uh, particles to model the coal. There's, um, th there's essentially there's a, um, a radiation calculation. Thermal radiation is a key piece of this. I'm going to uh, show you how we try and deal with that shortly. Um, we have sort of tabulated chemistry. We have a method for treating the particles. It's essentially a kind of views of particles as an ensemble, the uh, DQ-MOM method. And uh, there's many different aspects of this very complex calculation. So here are some, here's the kind of work that we're doing on this. Um, there are prototype uh, boilers. So here's a small boiler that we're working on that we have experimental data for. And on the right shows you the kind of uncertainty quantification that we're doing. So the red are the experimental results. The blue are the simulation results. And the green are the kind of consistent results you see for the temperature. There are no scales on this because it's all commercially sensitive. Um, and uh, Alstom, the company who's driving this, doesn't want the information to go out. But the only thing I should say is that these, this new generation of boilers operates at higher temperatures, is more efficient, and that's the rationale for doing this. It also uh, is better from a carbon sequestration point of view, and what they're planning to do, actually, is to take the, C the CO2 from this and pump it under the North Sea eventually, I believe. 
Um, in terms of solving these sorts of problems, we also have to solve large systems of equations. And the way that we've been doing that is with the uh, hypercode from Livermore. Um, we use a low Mach number approximation. And that leads to something that looks like a kind of incompressibility condition, a pressure Poisson equation. And we have to solve that somehow. What we're doing is using um, a basic conjugate gradient method with a very clever multigrid preconditioner and some, and some clever adaptive strategies to increase the performance. On the left is really rather an interesting picture because you know, we know that the, the cores on Mira are slower than the cores on, say, the Titan machine or the Blue Waters machine. Um, but one of the nice things about Mira is its communications network that you mentioned in your talk, because that communications network is beautiful, and it makes up for the, the slower cores in many ways. And so we've, what we've got here is a, um, a series of plots which show the Titan, uh, the Titan times at the bottom and the Mira times in relation to the Titan times. So you'd see for, if we look at the top line here, this is running on a 128. Uh, is it? No, it's more like actually a 30, 32 cube patch. Uh, yeah, sorry, 32 cube patch. That's right, 32 cube patch here. Sorry, 128 is down at the bottom. 32 cube patch. And what you see is as, as you go to 256k cores, the, the time on Titan gradually increases because of the communications network. Whereas on Mira, you get this beautiful flat scaling uh, because of the dedicated communications network. We haven't got mirror results out past 128k cores for this problem, mostly because we've had to do other things since we got these results. But we're going to return to this. And I think what the, the next set of results will show, actually, is that if we go out here, that Mira um, will actually perform as well as Titan for some of these practical configurations, even though the cores are much slower because it has a much better communications network. One of the things I should say is that one of the ways that we're going to a um, a higher order, a, a sort of a, well, a higher level sort of programming model is to use a domain specific language approach. And the one that we're using is called Nebo stroke Wasatch. Nebo is the actual internal part of it. Wasatch is a kind of more general um, fluid solver. And essentially, what this does is it uses the graph based approach at the level of the problem specification. So here we've got a um, an, an enthalpy diffusive flux is specified in terms of number of parameters. And here you actually see the, the graph-based graph kind of dependency uh, curve for this in terms of the variables. And so this is what we're using on an, on, a, on an individual core as well, or on a GPU. And we're generating code automatically for these cores and GPUs uh, based on this task graph approach. Um, and so, I showed you the architecture before. And when we go to uh, accelerators, the, the nodal architecture is kind of um, replicated in some sense. Because what we do now is we have to have a separate data warehouse for the GPUs or the Intel mics. And we run tasks actually on the GPUs and mics. And we try and make sure that we stack up tasks on those um, Either, on either the GPU or the mic, so that, that we can keep those busy all the time. And then we have a, a sort of connection. We use the PCIe bus to transfer information uh, across from the, the CPU to the uh, accelerator. Um, there's quite a bit here on what we do with GPUs, but maybe I will just give you the main idea, which is really shown at the, at the top here. So essentially, by using the concept of page lock memory, we can do data transfer and kernel execution at the same time on the GPUs, as opposed to the sort of normal approach of either doing data transfer or kernel execution. So we're using the, the sort of the, the, the CUDA asynchronous API to essentially make sure that we keep executing tasks on the GPU. Um, OK, and the kind of things that we see, here's our mini boiler um, and Nebo execution times for different problem sizes showing speed ups, good speed ups, factors of, of between 10 and 100 over CPU core uh, by using the GPU. So the GPU appears to be very good for us, especially at larger patch sizes when we've got 32, 
uh, cubed patches. Okay. And um, all that being said, our experience on both the GPUs and the mics has been relatively disappointing so far. And this is the area that we're going to have to focus on in the future. Um, I mean, we have a five-year project to solve this boiler problem. So it would be kind of embarrassing if we got it all to work 18 months into the project. Um, but anyway, um, this is a radiation calculation. And we see pretty poor scaling on the GPUs of, of, of Titan. Uh, this, is a, this is the same calculation with the blob of material that I showed earlier. And again, we don't see great scaling on the uh, in, uh, Xeon Phi's, the mics of the Sampede machine. So the performance is OK, but the strong scaling leaves a lot to be desired. And so we have quite a lot of work to do in that area. Even though we have an infrastructure that allows us to do that work relatively easily, um, we have a lot to do to get scaling. One of the big challenges for us, really, for the, um, the problem that we want to solve is how we actually solve linear systems on GPUs. And in order to do that, we're working with NVIDIA. They have a code called AMGX, which uh, is designed for GPUs and was used by them uh, up to, I think, thousands of GPUs already, although it, it's, its main application is for much smaller numbers of GPUs with commercial fluid solvers like Fluent and so on. So we're going, to check, we're going to see if we can use that. It's free for non-commercial use. And uh, we're working with NVIDIA to, to see if we can get that to scale on, on machines like Titan. The other piece of this is that I mentioned before that what we want to do is to go for portability. And um, one of the challenges is that we don't really want to rewrite lots of code in CUDA um, or you know, for the Xeon Phi's, we have a similar problem in that we don't really want to invest a huge amount of time in vectorization. Because in order to get performance out of the Xeon Phi's, you really have to use the uh, Intel vectorization approaches to uh, rewrite your code at a very low level. So superficially, the Xeon Phi's are attractive in the sense of it only took Ching Yu Meng something like four hours to get 800,000 lines of heavily templated C++ mounted on the Xeon Phi's when we first got access to the machine at supercomputing a couple of years ago. Um, so it's easy to get your code onto those machines. Getting good performance off those machines is just as difficult as with the GPUs. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's sort of like the conservation of complexity. You know, you either do the work in terms of rewriting your code in CUDA, or you do the work in terms of putting the vectorization and everything else in in terms of the uh, Intel mics. Um, one way of getting around that is that there's an interesting development coming out of the Sandia Labs, which is COCOS. Essentially, COCOS is a, is kind of an ex, uh, a sort of written in C++ and is using a sort of templated approach to change how a multi-dimensional arrays are implemented. So you can essentially change the layout of the multi-dimensional arrays at compile time to either take into account the, the data structures that you need for the Xeon Phi or the GPU. And this is work that's being done uh, by Carter Edwards and Dan Sunderland. Dan has just joined us in Utah um, as a research student. So here's an example of the kind of thing that they've been doing. So this is taken from one of their, their papers who very kindly gave me these two slides. And uh, they're looking at um, a molecular dynamics kernel and rewriting this. And um, what they're doing essentially is using a different approach, close in as opposed to further out, a standard kind of thing that's done in MD calculations. They're generating different layouts for the CPU and the GPU. And what you see in the bottom right there is the sort of performance that they're getting. So we have the Xeon performance here. The wrong, lay the wrong layout in red is the low performance. The better performance is here. Xeon Phi, actually not much better than the Xeon, which is kind of disappointing. And then with the K20X um, GPUs, uh, we get much better performance, actually. Uh, but again, some care has to be taken by using the uh, GPU texture cache to improve performance. So um, there's hope for us, I think, in that sense. And so perhaps what we're going to do, if we can, to see if we can use Cocos as an intermediate layer to avoid much of the sort of recompilation that might need to take place, particularly for our legacy codes. For our uh, 
current application, we can use the, the domain-specific language to generate code for the GPU and for the mic eventually, I guess. But uh, for our legacy codes, we have an issue of you know, wanting to keep those codes going. We have lots of applications that use them. We want to be able to uh, make those codes run on GPUs, and maybe Cocos is a way of doing that. We will see over the next couple of years. Um, I won't say anything on resilience, actually, but I should sort of stop there and just say that I hope I've shown you that this abstraction is very important and very helpful when it comes to getting performance on very large machines. Um, the layered approach that we've adopted is very important for not needing to change applications code and get performance. There are, there are no sort of soft options with regard to scalability. You, you're going to have to re-engineer something. We've re-engineered the runtime system um, a number of different times now and understand how to do that without changing the applications code. So that's a very powerful way of going about this. For us, the domain-specific language approach is very important in the future. Uh, but scalability is still a challenge. The, the, this, this graph approach is the gift that keeps on giving for us in some sense. And we're amazed when it works on every new machine, but it keeps, seems to keep working or can be made to work with relatively little effort. Uh, we have to get this to work better on GPUs and mics, but that's kind of the work for the next couple of years. And there I should stop. Thank you. Questions? Well, I have one that was just curious. You were saying that for the, um, the pink hole problem you needed, one millimeter resolution yes. across the whole box. I mean, that's is that fully resolved or, or like, uh, like you know, static resolution of a, of a millimeter? I'm just really St curious. static resolution. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. be, well, because of that wave number wave argument, the, the energy in the waves is you know to, to basically capture. Yeah, I mean, we think that that's that, well. I mean, that's what my colleagues are, are, are pushing and saying that they actually need. You know, one of the other comments is, well, could you get away? You know, given that we have AMR, what could you do with AMR? But the, if you look at the structure of the flow, it, there's, ev there's a lot going on everywhere with that flow. And so it's not an obvious candidate for AMR, even though we have the AMR infrastructure. What we are going to do is use AMR with radiation, because we can either solve a very large system of equations using the discrete ordinates methods for radiation, or we can use a ray tracing approach. Obviously, with the GPU's ray tracing is something that we ought to work well. But the way that we do ray tracing we have to transfer information. We have to essentially do the equivalent of very large all to all because we have to transfer heat fluxes around. Radiation results in heat fluxes. We have to move those heat fluxes to where they're needed. And so we, what, we, what we're going to do probably is use AMR in conjunction with the ray tracing to solve that problem, um, but not use AMR for the main calculation, though we could. My colleagues are not very happy with um, AMR and conservation for these kinds of problems on these adapted meshes. Although my argument to them is that I think it's a problem that's been at least partially solved, but they're not convinced. Questions, please. Yep. So you mentioned that you have uh, this like secondary long range interaction with your Leonard Jones approximations. That's with, yeah, well that was the work that was done with COCOS, yes. That's not my work. That's the work of uh, Carter Edwards and Dan Sunderland, yes. Right. And uh, do you have any notes about how you overcame like, memory coalescence problems with uh, GPUs? Or? Um, they have a paper on this. I don't recall seeing much in that paper uh, in terms of what they were doing on that. It was a fairly high-level description. They took an existing kernel and mapped it onto COCOS. And the, well, you can see the code. That's, that's sort of there as a, I mean, I don't know how much more complicated than that code was. I'm sure Dan, I'm sure Dan Sunderland will be happy to answer that question. Um, but uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know that they did anything particular. I think they, um, as I say, the results were, were, were sort of interesting in the sense that they could automatically generate those results for those three different machines uh, using this approach. So I think it shows a lot of promise. Yep. So um, I think you showed a problem with uh, I can't remember exactly the 1.13 billion cells or something. Mm -hmm. um, was that only for uh, scalability purpose, or it was actually a pra the practical calculation? Well, uh, no. And the reason I'm asking because I think you show also a large number of cores for that. Yeah. yeah. And so I think you can also solve it with, with fewer cores, right? Absolutely. I mean, what we what we wanted to do was we our target problem is the exploding containers. So the exploding containers involve um, material moving through a fluid. Okay, so 
so we, we, what, what we wanted to do was to make sure, we, to have a benchmark that uh, made it clear that we could actually operate the, uh, those scales on that kind of problem with, a, with, with AMR and fluid structure interaction. So we, put, we said, what's the simplest problem that we can deal with? Well, it's just a piece of material moving through a fluid. But as I say, the material is represented by particles. So the, the workload distribution is uneven because we have these particles moving across the domain. And we have an adaptive mesh around that block. So we have an adaptive mesh and particles. So it's a model problem for the full calculation. And it runs, we only, this thing only, I mean, that benchmark only runs for something like 20 time steps. Oh. It's not a huge, we don't run it out for a long, long time. We, and we try and make sure, but even those calculations on these machines do take up some considerable amount of time if we're running at the scales that we're running at. But we try and make sure that before we do the big science runs, is that we've nailed down almost everything in terms of you know, the uncertainty with regard to the code itself. And even then, we don't always get it right. I mean, but uh, we, we, we try and have benchmark problems that encapsulate the features of, the, of, of what we're trying to do. So for instance, for the, for the, for the clean coal problem, we have the, the mini boiler in the, in the same way as you know, uh, DOE has mini apps, for example. That, um, the mini boiler is actually very close to the real boiler, but it's still not the full calculation. And in the same way that the block, block of material moving through is a, is a kind of mini app for the full uh, exploding container problem. Well, I have one more. Okay. <laughs> I'm sort of curious if you could comment. Um, so, so Wasatch and, and Nebo, are they, for, for, for the DSL, is that, are those, is that a language that's in developing collaboration with you? Or? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. So, so, so the language is developed by um, um, James Sutherland, who's part of our PSAP team. We've been working with James for about five years now. And oh, and also Matt Might, who's a sort of compiler guy in computer science, actually, the pair of them together. And uh, so what they've, what they've been trying to do is to make sure that they can very efficiently generate the task code that executes on either on the GPU or a, um, you know, a, a, well, a, a Xeon 5 eventually or, a C, or just an ordinary CPU. And uh, this, the, the, the thing is about this is that it's an extensible domain specific language in the sense that it generates code that can be used in conjunction with the existing code. So it generates, um, you know, sort of extra C++ code that can be put in. So the whole problem doesn't have to be written in terms of the domain specific language. So it's a little bit more flexible than saying, we're just gonna have this brand new language that does everything. It, it's, it's sort of, it uses C++ template meta programming to do what it needs to do and to generate the code that's actually uh, uh, mapped onto the different machines. And how are, uh, generally, like, how, how is, what is your use model for it right now? Like, do you use it, parse the code, and, you know, bring it to, to the platform you're going to work on? Do you run it, or do you run it on the platform? Uh, you run it, you, I mean, you run it on the platform. Yes, you run it on the platform. I mean, the use model for it isn't, you know, we're just starting to use it now. The, those, those experiments that I showed are some of the first experiments that we've done with that. And we're just starting to use it. Uh, in anger now on the on the mini boiler, but the calculations, the the linear equation solutions that I showed, had something like uh, the, something like two trillion degrees of freedom um, with with the code that was generated from that. So the nodal code was actually generated using um, Wasatch and Nebo, and uh, it was it was ex it was executing on on Mira and on um, Titan in a scalable fashion out to the levels of, that we showed, which was about 256K cores on Titan and about 100 and something on Mira before we had a, a bug that we never resolved. And we, what we haven't yet resolved, hopefully we will resolve it. But um, yeah, so that's part of, that's an important part of what we're trying to do because this, this whole business about portability across these different architectures is the key problem for us, as it is for you guys, because you know, how do you, if the architectures are changing, you know, the GPUs are just about to go through another series of big changes. The, the next generation of mics is very, very different from the last generation of mics. Uh, you know, if, if the architectures are changing fairly dramatically every couple of years, that's a huge problem for any applications team. 